Hi there, I'm Blake from BAA Electronics, and on the bench today, I have an ICW32A handheld dual band VHF UHF amateur radio from probably around 2005 or so, that's my guess. This handheld was given to me by a video director who I work for who's getting out of the amateur radio hobby, and I'm just now getting into it. And in fact, it's a very similar size to my current HT that I was used, the ICT-10, although clearly much more functionality is in the W32 as compared to this. To be fair, it was twice the price when it came out. Now, most of the features in this handheld actually work fine. In fact, I shall put a battery in it. This is the BP-170 battery case that takes four AA size nickel metal hydride batteries. In fact, four of these are in it right now, these 2300 milliamp hour Energizer AA's. Specifically, you don't want to put alkalines in a case like this because the radio will charge the battery. Uh, here is its original nickel cadmium battery pack and, and it does in fact have the same three terminals as this does here. So I'm pretty sure the radio cannot tell the difference between these two battery packs. So it will charge this one if you put alkalines in it, and that's not fun, as you may have seen with some of those cheap alkaline chargers. So, nickel metal hydride battery pack. Go ahead and flip it over and slot it in. Now my test frequency here in Houston is 450.350. They're always transmitting. I actually don't know, I don't remember what AM station this is an uplink frequency for, but they're always transmitting, clearly, so I can use it to test. And as you can see, yep, if I turn up that side, it indeed does not function. Instead, By plugging in an external speaker to the speaker jack on the top, it does in fact function. So something's going on either in the speaker jack that's causing the internal speaker to not function, or there's an issue with the speaker itself. So that's what I'm seeking to repair today. The first thing I'm gonna have to do is get this guy open Thankfully, being an ICOM product, it is relatively easy to service yourself. In fact, I have the service manual up, although I didn't need it for this, and you might see why soon. So first of all, to take this back plate off, there are eight screws that need to be removed, not nine. So I'm going to remove these eight screws around the edge of the case to pull the back panel off. Something to keep in mind for these bottom screws, if you ever have to take one of these apart, is that they're different lengths. This one that came out of the top is actually slightly shorter than the ones that go on the bottom. So keep that in mind, and in fact I always have a magnetic parts tray nearby, so I'll go ahead and separate those. Alright, with all the screws removed, the rear panel should come off, and we should see the internals. Yes, I've been in here before. So immediately I can see a few things. That's where the speaker connects. There's a terminal here and here, and it is sticking to my screwdriver. Now I don't see the amplifier chip anywhere here. I tried to identify it earlier and couldn't find it. The speaker jack is on the other side of this board, so hopefully the issue does not lie up there. However, the first thing I wanna do is actually hook an oscilloscope up to these speaker terminals and see if I can see any audio coming across. All right, got it all ready to measure. I have connected the radio to DC power because you can't really see a battery in it without the case being closed. And I have tuned it to 450.350. It is indeed receiving right now. And the volume is turned up about halfway or so enough to where we should be able to measure it. 
So what I'm going to do now is connect the probe and connect one side to this metal shield up here. So we get a nice solid ground. So that is grounded. And then I'm going to put the probe on one side of the speaker. And that sure looks like audio to me. So even though the speaker's not working, we're getting audio here. And if I turn down the volume, yeah, it goes away. It doesn't even, yeah, it sort of triggers. Let me turn it up. There's the signal and it gets nice and loud. So clearly the amplifier circuit is working and it's something wrong with either the connection or the speaker itself. Uh, let's try the other side. No, there is no signal on the other side of the speaker. So somewhere, something's, something's not working right. Okay, so this is interesting. I pushed down harder on that terminal and the audio started coming out of the speaker. So even though I wasn't seeing it on the scope, I can hear audio coming out. Now the purpose of the scope being here, I, I could have totally just pressed on this with anything and it works. So the purpose of the scope was to show that Indeed, if you can get some kind of signal out of the amplifier chip, then that'll narrow down a lot of possible issues. Um, so now we know it's probably something simple, either connection's bad, or the speaker's bad, or trace being bad, because as I flex the circuit board, that's when the speaker starts working. And specifically on this side, if I push on the other side, nothing happens. If I push on this side, there's a little bit of give. I can feel it when I press down with the screwdriver. And the speaker starts working. So the first thing I'm going to try is I'm going to reflow that terminal on the speaker with just some normal uh, leaded solder and see if that'll make it work again. Because I do notice, and this may be really hard to see, I may have to change the lenses for this, that solder joint does not look solid. I would put my trust in it because it's a solder joint, but it doesn't look particularly nice compared to the other side. So that also could be a possible thing to look out for with this is a cracked solder joint, possibly because someone was either overdriving the speaker or dropped it or whoever, whoever knows what happened to this. So I'm gonna reflow that. Well, dang it. It's not perfect, but it'll hold. It looks like it. All right, power. That was not power. This is power. Really? Hey. You have that kind of fan base? It's huge in America. Only, only country. He was huge. But of course, Ringo's the star of the Hard Day's Night, and he's the star of Help. He is. All right, well, that was a super simple fix, and all it turned out to be was somehow the wire got detached from one side of the speaker. Uh, when I desoldered it, it wanted to stick to the magnet of the speaker, so that was fun. Um, so I just bent it into place and resoldered it on both sides. Did I do a good job? Eh, probably not, but it holds, and clearly it works. So I'm going to put it back together. Now remember, short screws in the top of the shiny metal part. Long ones go in the lower part. And I think it does help to do the 
top one first because then the bottom holes will be a little bit better aligned. I probably just cut out about three minutes of me fighting with the bottom screws to drift, try to drift the screw hole into the right spot just because the top one is run in. So yeah, do these first. It makes it easier. While I'm here, why did they have to make this so shiny and the screws so difficult to get in? Because on my on my T10, it the back of it literally just looks like I don't know recycled aluminum cans or something. I would have preferred this because I can fingerprint it all I want and you'll never see any of them. Yeah, 90s be different. Okay, battery is on. And there it is. Oh yeah, if you don't turn it off and you take the power off, once you put the power back on, it just it just starts working. It's nice and loud too. So I believe that this HT is now fully functional. In fact, here's the final test. KJ6BAA radio check, radio check. Indeed, the mic sounds pretty good. So thank you for watching this short little repair video on this nice vintage ICOM HT, and I'll say 7-3 for now. Good night.